Assalamu alaikum. As many of you have requested, we will be discussing the story of Adam very shortly, inshallah, in coming segments. But before we do this, we have to address the story of the mosquito, a prerequisite for the story of Adam, as we shall see. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Rabbi shrah li sadri wa yassir li amri wa hlul uqdatan min lisani yafqahu qawli. For most people, the first mention of Adam in the story of Adam in Surah Al-Baqarah starts with ayah number 30. But for us, as you shall see, it starts with ayah number 26. In this segment, we will continue the discussion about dhikr. This is part of a series that we started five segments ago with a segment that's called Why No Stories Equal No Quran. And if you remember, we started with the story of the son of Prophet Nuh alayhi salam. In this segment, inshallah, we will continue the discourse on dhikr, how we learn the Quranic Abrahamic locution by extracting such locution from dhikr. We will also discuss several examples of nested interpretation. This is a technique that we've used as a bayina in many, many different segments on this channel before. In this segment, we will also provide number of examples of linguistic analysis and we will rely very heavily on a new type of bayina that we have not exposed before. This is the first time we expose so many different things. This is an extremely critical segment and I hope you stay with us all the way to the end so you can achieve the maximum benefit from it. For the first time we will be combining tafsil and the distributive law. In this segment, we will also allow the Quran to teach us about its own style and about its own techniques and about its own vocabulary and semantics and even morphology. For the first time, you're going to learn new morphology that the Quran uses. We will provide a detailed description of this term called ba'uda or ba'udatun that's used in the Quran. We will include several new terms of the Abrahamic locution. And as usual, we provide a number of gifts in this segment. Inshallah, we will have six gifts. We assume, as before in every segment on this channel, that you will watch the other parts of this series before you tackle this one. Remember, this is an academic presentation. It's not for entertainment purposes. We ask that you take it very seriously. We use the organic Quranic methodology, which is extracted from the Quran, because the Quran is a unique thing. There's nothing like it whatsoever. And therefore, it must provide us its own methodology for engaging it and for learning from it with the engagement of the Quran. The understanding comes from the Samawat from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We use the Abrahamic locution. If you're not familiar with the concept of Abrahamic locution, please watch the playlist on this channel that is titled Abrahamic locution to get more familiar with this concept. And finally, please do not comment or ask questions unless you have seen the whole video. Many times we're receiving a lot of different questions and the answers are within the segment itself. So we get right away into the ayat of the mosquito, the verses that talk about the mosquito. And we start right away with a typical translation, typical interpretation given by some of the interpreters of the Quran in the books of Tafsir and some of the translators. We start with the ayah itself, number 26, and then we will proceed to number 27 in a few minutes. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم إن الله لا يستحيي أن يضرب مثلا ما بعوضة فما فوقها فأما الذين آمنوا فيعلمون أنه الحق من ربهم وأما الذين كفروا فيقولون ماذا أراد الله بهذا مثلا يضل به كثيرا ويهدي به كثيرا وما يضل به إلا الفاسقين so the typical translation goes something like this. This is from Sahih International. Indeed, Allah is not timid to present an example, that of a mosquito or what is smaller than it. And those who have believed know that it is the truth from their Lord. But as for those who disbelieve, they say, what did Allah intend with this as an example? 
He misleads many thereby and guides many thereby, and he misleads not except the defiant and disobedient. This is ayah number 26. As I said, ayah 27, we will discuss it shortly, but this gives you a taste of the challenges we're having with the translations and the interpretations. First, a general comment, all of them are wrong. All of them. All of them are not adequate. They don't ascribe to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala his due reverence as we shall see. Second, all the translations are built on the interpretations. The interpretations, the books of tafsir, themselves have created the confusion to start with. And we're going to see it firsthand and you're going to understand exactly the significant problem that we are suffering in this area. So this translator, Sahih International, used the word Allah is not timid, assigning timid timid as an attribute to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Of course, Allah is not timid, of course, but we cannot even ascribe to Allah something like that. The problem is most of the translators followed in the same path. So Pickthall uses the word disdains. It's a little bit easier. But Shakir uses the word ashamed. And, um, you know, other translators like Sarwar uses the word hesitate. Uh, Muhsin Khan is not ashamed. And Arbery, who is, by the way, is not a Muslim, uses God is not ashamed and so on. All of them follow in the same path. We're going to see a detailed analysis of this problem. The other problem is that they all said that that of a mosquito or something smaller to it or something above it or something on it, as if the mosquito is actually discussed in this verse, in this ayah. As we shall see, it is not at all. It's just a word that's thrown to mean something totally different. So these are some of the problems and we're left at the end of their translations and their interpretations not understanding what is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talking about. Why is Allah mentioning the mosquito, so to speak? Ba'uda. So I remind you that we will use the technique that we've used before. This is a bayina, an instrument of extracting evidence called tafsil, tafsil, and it means syntactic segmentation. And that's the practice or the art, so to speak, of taking a sentence or a number of sentences and figuring out exactly where the punctuation fits and how the configuration of the different clauses and the different sentences combine to give us meaning, to give us the understanding. So as we said before, the guidance for the correct tafsil comes direct from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we've described this in full detail in the prior segments in this series. This is an example from part 2.2 a segment that's called how to circumcise a she-cow and if you recall we discussed ayah number 271 and we illustrated how by segmenting this ayah correctly or this portion of the ayah correctly we understood something of a significant warning that is included in the quran for us and we ended up with the interpretation that says and they slaughtered her and whatever they schemed in the past, they still do. What gave us this profound understanding is the ability to do tafsil with the guidance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to understand how to extract right meaning. So again, this is a bayina that we will make use of extensively in this segment again. So we get right away into the verses or the ayat about the mosquito. Ayah number 226 and ayah number two. 27. So I will give you immediately the correct translation, the final translation, and then we will dive slowly in every part of those two ayat. So we will read it in Arabic first. A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajim. Inna Allah la yastahyi an yadriba mathalan ma ba'udatan fa ma fawqaha. Fa amma al-lazina amanu fa ya'lamuna annahu al-haqq min rabbihim. Wa amma al-lazina kafaru fa yaquluna maadha arad Allahu bihadha mathala. Yudillu bihi kathiran wa yahdi bihi kathiran. وما يضل به إلا الفاسقين الذين ينقضون عهد الله من بعد ميثاقه ويقطعون ما أمر الله به أن يوصل ويفسدون في الأرض أولئك هم الخاسرون 
So the translation and the interpretation that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has allowed me to share with you is as follows. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Allah does not seek to create hardship in life for groups among Bani Israel. Now I jumped a little bit over this because as you see, this is a parenthetical clause. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us Allah does not seek to create hardship in life for groups among Bani Israel who incite disagreement. The definition of this group is people who sow divisions by biting and injecting misleading information. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not do so by singling out any parable. In other words, the purpose of singling out parables is not to create hardship in life for such groups of people. In other words, the Quran is inviting such groups of people, despite knowing full well what they do and how they behave, is inviting them to come back to the guidance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As we will see, we will discuss it more in detail. And the reason Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is referring to them as a ba'uda is they accept nothing above them. This group arrogantly rejected all those that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala elevated above them. فَأَمَّا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا فَيَعْلَمُونَ أَنَّهُ الْحَقُّ مِنْ رَبِّهِمْ And thus, as for those who attain to belief, they have the evidence-based knowledge that this divine declaration from Allah is the truth from their Lord. وَأَمَّا الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا فَيَقُولُونَ مَاذَا أَرَاضَ اللَّهُ بِهَذَا مَثَلًا And as to those who reject it, they say, what did Allah want to convey with this parable? يُضِلُّ بِهِ كَثِيرًا وَيَهْدِي بِهِ كَثِيرًا Allah uses it to misguide many people and He uses it to guide many. But He uses it to misguide only the deviants, الفاسقين. And then Ayah 27 starts by proceeding to further describe this group of people. They, the Ba'uda, those who rejected, the many whom Allah disguides, and the deviants, all of them, renege on the covenant of Allah after it has been established with them. In other words, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is starting ayah 27 by describing this group which has been detailed in ayah number 26. Again, we shall see all the details. I will lay it out one word at a time, one particle at a time, one letter at a time, so you understand exactly why we're ending up with this kind of translation. And then we continue. This group, they disjoint that which Allah commanded to be linked. If you remember, we talk about the linking between the different ayat in the, in the scripture, in the Quran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is warning us, those who disjoint those ayat, who take each ayah as a separate island, are being warned in this ayah. And they corrupt in the scripture, those are the losers. So this is the translation of ayah 26, 27. As you see, there's a lot of details that we need to go through. So in the rest of this segment, we will break it down one step at a time and we will detail it inshallah. First, step number one, which is a reference to inna Allah la yastahyi. As you noticed, you listen to me, yastahyi. If you listen to any tajweed of this ayah from any of the major reciters, and you can find a, a number of them on the YouTube or the internet, you listen to them very carefully. This is not yastahyi. This is yastahyi. So we're going to get into this in just a few minutes. But before this, I wanted to lay out in front of your eyes a full survey of exactly how different interpreters and different translators refer to the word yastahyi. So to start, we need to recognize that this word yastahyi occurred in one other place in the Quran. It occurred in Surah 28, Ayah number 4, Surah Al-Qasas. إِنَّ فِرْعَوْنَ عَلَى فِي الْأَرْضِ وَجَعَلَ أَهْلَهَا شِيَعًا يَسْتَضْعِفُ طَائِفَةً مِّنْهُمْ يُذَبِّحُ أَبْنَاءَهُمْ وَيَسْتَحْيِي نِسَاءَهُمْ إِنَّهُ كَانَ مِنَ الْمُفْسِدِينَ يَسْتَحْيِي Yes, you heard me stress it right. There is a skoon on the ha, which means it's a silent ha, yastah. And then there is a kasra on the ya which is yi, which means there is another ya after it. 
and this is how it's indicated this is how it's pronounced by all the reciters and the, the specialists of tajweed you have to say yes tahi and the interesting part is that the exact same spelling the exact same phonation for both cases in ayah 226 and in ayah 28 4. so let's look at how the books of tafsir dealt even though this is exactly the same word the same word in both surah and how they dealt with the interpretation of this same exact word so we will go very quickly just to give you a quick survey but it's in front of you and you can look at it i will enlarge it a little bit so you can have access to it so at tabari referred to it as la yakhsha he's not afraid and in the case of surah 28 4 keeping their females alive this is the basic meaning he gave zamakhshari he used the word haya haya and he says haya is the same as hayat which is live or to live and in this case he referred to keeping their females alive in the case of surah al-baqarah he referred to shy in al-razi he says allah is not reluctant and he referred to the effect of haya which is to leave to leave the action to stop the action that you're doing because you're shy so it's sort of the flip side of the same coin and so on and so forth al qurtubi he says reluctant ibn kathir he says reluctant fayruz abadi he says he does not disdain and al baghawi he says both he says haya and yatruk meaning to abandon and shyness both so he's negating both al jawzi both and so on ibn ashur says he does not abandon he does not ya'ba la ya'ba and al tantawi says both haya and abandon and al khalili who is a contemporary scholar from oman says he does not abandon la yamtana in the interpretation of surah 28 the exact same word they all agreed that this is about forcing the females to stay alive despite the hardship of staying alive despite the hardship of life so let's look at the translators in the case of surah al-baqarah pickthal says disdains uh, yusuf ali says disdains shaki says is not ashamed literally that's his translation sayyid hussein nasr not ashamed Arbery, not ashamed. Asad does not disdain, and so on. Uh, Abdul Halim says he's not shy. Allah is not shy. And Mustafa Khattab does not shy away. Sahih International is not timid, and so on. And in the case of Surah Al Qasas, they all pretty much agree with the interpreters, which means to spare the women or to keep them alive despite hardship. Al Qadri has a very interesting detail added to his interpretation he says letting their women alive but also pushing them into all sorts of situations where it's not appropriate for women to be in and so on so let's look at surah al-qasas and i will give you the interpretation that i have worked on based on the understanding of surah al-qasas inshallah in a future segment we will detail a lot more but i will give you the interpretation of this specific ayah in the pharaoh now ala fil ardi wa jala ahlaha shi'an yastadifu ta'ifatan minhum yudabihu abnaahum wa yastahyi nisaahum innahu kana min al mufsidin our interpretation translation is Indeed, Fir'aun exalted himself using the scripture. He has covertly fragmented its cohort, meaning Ahl al-Ard, into feuding gangs, undermining one sect among them by castrating their sons and creating hardship in life for their women, meaning to seek survival on their own under harsh conditions. Indeed, he was among those who spread corruption. So this is the general interpretation of this part which is surah 28 the ayah that includes yastahyi but in the surah 226 which includes the exact same word we shall see that it's a lot more tricky to come up with the right interpretation so we'll go back to the ayat up here in allah la yastahyi our translation is allah does not seek to create hardship for groups for groups and we're going to see bauda in just a few minutes but first we need to deal with an yadriba mathalan an yadriba mathalan includes this preposition ma this 
negation in general. مثلاً ما. It's a particle that the vast majority of interpreters and all the translators decided that this is an extraneous particle. It's a word that really doesn't mean anything and they didn't assign any meaning to it whatsoever. And you will see for yourself. So let's go to bullet number two. We will understand how we reach this conclusion. So first, let me assert so that it's really clear. There is not a single word. There's not a single letter. There's not a single accent, diacritic accent that is included in the Quran that is not relevant. There is no such thing as extraneous anything in the Quran. Everything is perfect. Otherwise, we don't believe that the words of Allah are perfect. And what does that say about Allah when you believe that there are some extraneous things? They, I don't know how they thought about this. To be honest with you, I'm giving up to try to come up with excuses for these interpreters and translators. But you're going to see with your own eyes that when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses the exact same structure without ma, it means something. And with ma, it means something else. It's logical. It's reasonable to understand it that way. So the ayah, just to remind you, in Allah la yastahyi an yadriba mathalan ma ba'udatan. So this is the ma that we're talking about in here. All the interpreters decided it's extraneous and the translators followed suit. Now let's look at a number of examples and I've listed all of them in front of you right here. So you can take your time and look at them one by one. I'm only going to go through two or three of them just to illustrate that Allah knows how to use the expression darab Allahu mathalan. So, alam tara kayfa darab Allahu mathalan kalimatan tayyibatan. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is using the expression darab Allahu mathalan which is to single out an example and then he immediately proceeds to give you the example without any thing in between without any ma or interjection of any particle etc darab allahu mathalan kalimatan so kalimatan is the word the goodly word and the kalima is the example the parable here's another example darab allahu mathalan abdan mamlukan allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has singled out the example or the parable of a slave an owned slave and here's a third example وَضَرَبَ اللَّهُ مَثَلًا رَجُلَيْنِ two men again nothing in between وَضَرَبَ اللَّهُ مَثَلًا قَرِيَةً ضَرَبَ اللَّهُ مَثَلًا رَجُلَيْنِ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us several other examples as you see in front of you so the translation and interpretation for this ayah right here ayah 26 or at least this portion of it is as follows by singling out any parable, so we translated it as any parable, مثلاً ما, any parable. It's not a specific parable. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not including a parable in this ayah. He's saying by singling out any parable. So it's a methodological instruction. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us, you see all of these dhikr, parables and stories, the purpose of those is not, as we still see, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not seek to create hardship in life for the people he's speaking about or talking to. In this case, a group of inciters of disagreement. Why do I say this about Ba'uda? We're going to see it in detail next. So let's go again to where we are in the story and remember where we stand. So, so far we've covered yastahyi and we said the right meaning is to seek to create hardship or to push someone by creating hardship for them in their life. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not do that. He's not trying to make it harsh, to make it difficult for people. And by singling out any parable, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not doing that. So in other words, the order in this ayah is أَنْ يَضْرِبَ اللَّهُ مَثَلًا إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يَسْتَحِي By singling out any parable, Allah does not seek to create hardship in life for etc, etc, etc. So now we're going to see Ba'uda and we're going to dive into this extensively and intensely. And you're going to be very impressed inshallah. I hope you stay awake and you remain with us throughout this analysis. So for Ba'uda, we're going to do the linguistic analysis. Ba'uda or Ba'udatun, I'm going to refer to it as Ba'udatun because I want to stress that there is a Ta Marbuta at the end. The morpheme fa'ul, which is not this one. This is ba'udatun. 
Fa'ulatun. But we're going to start with something a little simpler. Fa'ul. Fa'ul. Indicates several possible meanings. And for those of you who are not familiar with Ilm al-Sarf, Ilm al-Sarf uses morphemes, which are special patterns of letters that are based on the gerund. And when you take this pattern and apply it to any gerund, it gives you a consistent refraining meaning, the same kind of meaning for different gerunds. So if I say hamala as a gerund, which means to carry, hamil, the morpheme is fa'il, it means the one who carries, the actor, the agent. If I say mahmul, which is the morpheme of maf'ul, that means he's being carried. So those morphemes give us some indications just by their structure. And this is the beauty of the Arabic language itself. The structure of the Arabic language includes over 700 such morphemes. So let's look at some examples. So we said the morpheme fa'ul, which is ba'ud, ba'ud, the first part of this word, ba'ud, not including the ta marbuta. So the morpheme fa'ul indicates several possible meanings. The first meaning is an active participle, it's in fa'il, such as Rasul. So Rasul is a messenger, he's an agent, he's the one who carries out a mission of delivering the message. Ajul, someone who is in a rush. So th these are descriptive words based on the morpheme, I can quickly understand what they mean, even if I've never seen that word before. It also, it also means an infinitive noun, masdar. The masdar, which is infinitive, is the noun in nasb that comes third in the conjugation of the verb. So we say daraba, yadribu, darban. So the third in the sequence of the conjugation of that jadr or verb is, is the masdar. Sorry for these technical words, but these are really critical. I need to be able to present the evidence so that you become accustomed with how we do the interpretation of the Quran. I don't want you to ever take my opinion at face value. This is not what this channel is all about. I'm not here to give you my opinion, to give you my take on it. No, I'm giving you the information and the evidence so that you learn it, first of all. Second, so you develop the confidence that we're not speaking from hawa, from fancy, from opinions. All right, more importantly, the morpheme, this morpheme, fa'ul, fa'ul, has two specific indications in the Quran. And we're going to give you the example. We're going to show you how we learn. We learn from the Quran. We let the Quran teach us how did it use this morpheme, fa'ul. So it has the active function, meaning someone who does, such as Rasul. So the Rasul is expected to carry out a function, active, being the agent, the one who does. But it also has passive circumstance. What does that mean? That means there's a condition that was imposed on the agent that made him become this agent. In other words, something drove him to become the way he is supposed to function. And we're going to look at the example of Rasul again. The case of Rasul, he carries out the mission of Risala or the message, but he's also selected by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or by whoever sent him as a Rasul, a messenger. So there is the passive part, which is the selection. He was selected and there is a mission he's supposed to be carrying out. And therefore we have active component and the passive component. And we're going to look at an example from Surah Yasin, Surah number 36. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, أَوَلَمْ يَرَوْا أَنَّا خَلَقْنَا لَهُمْ مِمَّا عَمِلَتْ أَيْدِينَا أَنْعَامًا فَهُمْ لَهَا مَالِكٍ But the word I'm focusing on is أَنْعَامًا and the translation is livestock. So I'm not going to go through the whole first ayah. Let's go to the next ayah. وَذَلَّلْنَاهَا لَهُمْ And we have tamed such livestock. So ha is the pronoun feminine that refers back to the plural of أَنْعَام and it is such livestock. So we have tamed such livestock for the benefit of them, for their benefit. For, comma, some of such livestock constitute their means of riding for transportation. Their means of riding for transportation. You notice there is a plural inherent in there, and there is the concept of the function. The function is to provide a ride for transportation. So there is the passive, which is they were tamed, these animals were tamed, this livestock, 
some of them were tamed and these animals also provide the function which is the means of riding for transportation so such livestock has the active function they provide the ride and the passive circumstance which is they did not choose to provide the ride on their own they were tamed to be subjugated for providing the ride or the function so therefore ajul ba'ud rasul all of these morphemes fa'ul includes both of these meanings there's a positive active and there's a passive meaning conditions that were imposed on the agent so let's continue now we move on to the next morpheme which is fa'ulatun fa'ulatun right here so fa'ulatun fa'ulatun is a morpheme and it indicates several possible meanings so we take fa'ul and we add to it one of the meanings is the most obvious one because there's a ta marbuta here it provides the feminine active participle or in the case of non-sentient beings we also use the feminine to refer to a plural so in the quran allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses this mechanism of ta marbuta of adding this ta marbuta right at the end to provide right at the end to provide the plural the concept of plural and we have seen this in surah abasa in the segments of surah abasa as there is a ta marbuta at the end a ta marbuta at the end indicates plural so ta marbuta in here is the indication that it's a plural or something that happens multiple times so let's review so there's a feminine active participle or there is all of these meanings that we just saw in here which is the active function and the passive circumstance the same thing but we add the plural this time so in the case of ba'uda it has ba'ud which has the active function plus the conditions that were imposed plus there's a plural so all of these three meanings are included in the morpheme this is something we learned from the quran this is purely from the quran we're learning as we are using so let's look at the example from surat al-an'am allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says وَمِنْ الْأَنْعَامِ حَمُولَةً وَفَرْشًا كُلُوا مِمَّا رَزَقَكُمُ اللَّهِ etc. to the end of the ayah and from such livestock the means to carry cargo so the word hamulatan hamulatan means the means to carry cargo the first thing we notice is that it is plural because an'am is plural it is also a masdar that means it's an infinitive noun it's an infinitive noun and it has all of these meanings that we saw in fa'ulatun so first it's plural second there is a function it carries out and third it was imposed on it that condition was imposed on it, it wasn't by choice so allah subhanahu wa ta'ala teaches us by giving some of these examples the morpheme fa'ulatun occurs only in three places in the whole quran one of them is ba'udatun one of them is mathubatun which means the recompense that allah gives positive or negative depending on what you did and third, hamulatun. This is the third example. These are the only three words so we have to learn from the Quran. This is not part of traditional Arabic per se. It is not something that every Arabic speaking person knows innately. So now we see the meaning. Let's move on. There are a few more things that we need to talk about. So we continue with the linguistic analysis of ba'udatun. So the term ba'd we're all familiar with this indicates part of or fragment of or portion of it is used extensively in surah al-baqarah to refer bani israel by the way this is just between parentheses gives us a hint so allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking throughout surah al-baqarah most of it is about bani israel he talks about ba'dukum min ba'din ba'd 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 referring to bani israel at the very top of the surah he uses the word ba'uda so now we're starting to see where this is going there's the concept of plural ba'udatun there's the concept of segmentation fragmentation and there's the concept of a function they actually do related to the same meaning to the same ba'd which is fragmentation so now we can build the semantic cloud so to speak and start understanding what ba'uda means what is it referring to is it really referring to the mosquito we're gonna see 
So thus, in accordance with the morpheme fa'ulatun, ba'udatun now indicates the active function. They fragment and divide. They incite fragmentation and division. Passive circumstance, they are fragmented and divided, a condition that was imposed on them. And they are a group, plural. Plural or they do fragmentation multiple times. They do fragmentation multiple times. So, in other words, this is a group of people who are themselves divided and yet they all seek a common function, a shared function, common attribute to all of them, fragment and divide others. Are we talking about all Bani Israel? Of course not. Don't make that mistake. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala clearly states that not all of them have these characteristics applicable to them. So we say a group among Bani Israel. The people that we will see, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes them in a lot of detail. Now there's one more thing. The verb ba'ada, the verb ba'ada includes an indication of to bite. And this is pure Arabic. This is really authentic Arabic. And hence the term ba'udatun, which means mosquito or mite or gnat, is actually derived from that meaning. So now we see the verb ba'da is the gerund for the word ba'uda that means mosquito. This is not what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about, the actual mosquito. He's talking about the root meaning, the, the gerund itself, which is to bite, to hurt, to cause problems to its victim. And as we saw the fragmentation. So now our semantic cloud is growing and now we understand more and more about this word ba'uda. And we also need to understand and remember that the mosquito injects a liquid chemical that causes harm to its victim. In other words, there's the sense of putting something in to cause the division. Here now we reach the final conclusion. So ba'udatun as is used in ayah 2, 26, implies a group of people, specifically a group of people among Bani Israel, who are divided and yet they regularly actively seek to divide others and they regularly actively bite others, meaning cause some harm, injecting a liquid that causes harm to their victims. Now, am I making things up by specifically talking about Bani Israel? No, you will see Ayah 27 is very explicit, very clear, and we're going to read it and you're going to understand exactly why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is referring to this group as Ba'uda. So now let's go back to the original text of the ayat 26-27 and we see where we stand. إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يَسْتَحْيِي أَنْ يَضْرِبَ مَثَلًا مَا بَعُودَةً By singling out any parable, Allah does not seek to create hardship in life for groups among Bani Israel. Now we added groups, plural. Why? Because Ba'uda implies groups. They are already fragmented. They're not one group. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continues. These groups incite disagreement. How do we know that? From the term Ba'd, Tab'id, which is to fragment. So all of these meanings are right there. And we can describe them a little bit more. Such groups are people who sow divisions by biting, by harming, by hurting, by causing problems, and injecting misleading information. Does that remind you of all of the things that we've been talking about in this channel? Perhaps. Now we come to the last part of this first section of Ayah 26. فَمَا فَوْقَهَا And these are two words that have caused all sorts of hardships for interpreters and for many different preachers and internet superstars who take on these words as if they have discovered, you know, rocket science, and you will see how simple they are and how elegant they are and how easy to link within the same surah. There's no need to think these are the cause of confusion. The translation that we will give and then we will detail again is for, meaning because, these groups, they accept nothing above them. فَمَا فَوْقَهَا So the interpreters looked at ma in here and they decided it is ism wasl, the relative pronoun. But in this case, based on tafsil, 
we are assigning ma the negation meaning there is nothing above them meaning Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is describing them as this group don't accept anybody above them so therefore Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not the one who creating the hardship for them they are creating the hardship for themselves because they refuse to allow anybody to come and give them guidance from above in other words this group arrogantly rejected and continue to reject anyone that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala elevated above them elevated where did you get this Dr. Haney let's look at note number four right here so we go down to note number four and we see first the particle fa the particle fa fama fawqaha there's the letter fa at the beginning the letter fa is a connective particle that is usually translated as and then so and thus meaning therefore but it's also used as the particle of cause it's called al fa as so when you use it at the end of a sentence you're giving the cause of what you said earlier in the sentence and this is exactly where we are so it is translated as behold or because or as we did for comma for comma let's look at some examples in surat an nisa Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says أَمْ يَحْسُدُونَ النَّاسَ عَلَى مَا أَتَاهُمُ اللَّهُ مِنْ فَضْلِهِ فَقَدْ آتَيْنَا آلَ إِبْرَاهِيمَ الْكِتَابَ وَالْحِكْمَةِ Because or behold we have allowed the followers of Ibrahim etc etc So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving the justification the justification for why these people are envious of others and so on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in surat An-Nisa also gives another example yes aluka ahlul kitab an tunazzila alayhim kitaban min as-sama'i faqad sa'alu musa akbara min dhalik they ask you to bring down a scroll an actual book from heaven in physical form and behold because for comma they have asked musa more than that so as you see we have the example used within the quran for the letter fa to mean because or for comma and this is exactly what we do in our translation now we continue with bullet number four here point number four let's look at the concept of fawq above in surah al-baqarah Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala same surah Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us وَإِذْ أَخَذْنَا مِيثَاقَكُمْ وَرَفَعْنَا فَوْقَكُمْ الطُّورِ remember الطُّورِ we described this and detailed it in the video labeled Moses and Malcolm X and the transformation they went through. This is the word Atur, which refers to Musa himself. So therefore Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala elevated Musa above them. But as we shall see when we read the story of Musa and interpret it, they rejected even Musa. And Surah Al-Qasas is full of references to where these people did not accept Musa and challenged him and created all sorts of problems for him even after the exodus even after he saved them from Fir'aun but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is reminding us in Surah Al-Baqarah we have elevated Musa above you and again in Surah Al-Baqarah number 93 we have taken your oath and we elevated Musa above you in exchange for that oath but they reneged, they rejected, as we shall see in Surah Al-Baqarah 227. Very clear, it is talking about the same group of people. Mithaq is used as a marking between this part of the Surah and the earlier part that we are interpreting. In Surah An-Nisa, number 154, again the same thing. وَرَفَعْنَا فَوْقَهُمْ الطُّورِ We elevated above them. Atur, the one with the multiple stages in life, Musa himself. And in Surah Yusuf, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala refers to the knowledgeable man. وَفَوْقَ كُلِّ ذِي عِلْمٍ عَلِيمٍ Anyone who claims to have knowledge, above him there is a more knowledgeable person. And this is a declarative statement that applies to everyone and especially Bani Israel that we're talking about in here. And now we have a complete understanding of the first four portions of the first ayah. So by singling out any parable, any kind of parable, Allah does not seek to create hardship. He's not the one who is actually causing the hardship in life. For whom? 
for the groups among Bani Israel who incite this agreement and who do all of these things for because they accept nothing above them they don't accept the guidance from Allah so it is not Allah who is creating the hardship for them they're creating the hardship for themselves Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is clarifying and he cites all sorts of stories in the Quran referring to the history of Bani Israel and the hardships they went through and is explaining that now we have a new guidance again and let's see if you're gonna accept this guidance this is the context of these ayat Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about Bani Israel describing them as ba'uda meaning groups but who create enmity among others who create divisions who seek to sow seeds of divisions and create problems etc etc because they don't accept any guidance from up above they don't allow any prophet any messenger to bring them the guidance they desperately need but they refuse to accept this is the context of these ayat now we continue these ayat and they're gonna illuminate they're gonna radiate with clarity and brilliance and you're gonna understand exactly what the context of Surah Al-Baqarah and by default the story of Adam which we're gonna see starting the next segment inshallah based on this ayat is very clear so we repeat by singling out any parable Allah does not seek to create hardship in life for anyone especially for groups among Bani Israel who incite this agreement and who are described as people who sow divisions by biting and injecting misleading information for they themselves accept no one nothing above them they don't accept anybody above them this is the the ma of negation and now it's very clear let's continue and the rest is very simple as you will see it fits beautifully together and thus as for those who attain to belief amanu, they believe they have the evidence-based knowledge that it is meaning this divine declaration from Allah we just read is the truth from their Lord as to those who rejected they say what did Allah want to convey with this parable Allah did not even give a parable there is no parable in here this is a declarative statement about any parable all parables in the Quran this is a generic methodological statement that says Allah is not the one who's bringing you the hardship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives you the examples if you don't accept anyone above you then you're creating the hardship in life for yourself this is the beauty of this ayah now we continue and as to those who have rejected they say what did Allah want to convey with this parable and then Allah makes a declaration Allah uses it to misguide many people and he uses it to guide many but he uses it to misguide only the deviants and we've talked about this so many times if you enter the Quran with the wrong assumptions you're insisting that there are repeating stories that were borrowed plagiarized copied brought over from the older scriptures you're gonna see exactly what you're seeking you're not gonna learn something new and this is exactly what happened with all the interpreters unfortunately they missed totally this ayah and these meanings because they are seeing the word مثلاً, بعودةً, and they have no problem dismissing this particle ma and therefore they confused themselves they refused to seek knowledge from the Quran they did not allow anyone above them they felt they know better and thus all the interpreters went astray on this one as you will see when we read and discuss the story of Adam this is essential to understand the story of Adam you cannot understand the story of Adam without first understanding this part of Surah Al-Baqarah and that's why we are starting with it on this channel we go now to ayah number 27 now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving more descriptions they the ba'uda as we describe them up here those who rejected the many whom Allah misguides 
the deviants, etc. All of those mentioned in this ayah 26. Alladina, this is the relative pronoun. They renege on the covenant of Allah after it has been established with them. Renege meaning they renounce or violate or reject or break that agreement, that contract, that covenant between them and Allah. And by the way, the covenant applies to us Muslims. All of us who believe in Allah and who engage in the Quran are to be upholding the covenant with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What is the covenant? The covenant is that Allah gives you the understanding if you engage and if you follow through on the instructions and if you approach the Quran and the scripture and the words of Allah with submission, with pure heart, with an empty cup, you don't approach the words of Allah with shirk, with associating with Allah other deity, other sources of information, more authoritative references on top of the Quran. That's the covenant. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the supreme authoritative source of knowledge. No one else should be more authoritative than Allah. If you believe in that, you're upholding the covenant. If you violate that, you're breaking the covenant. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about those people. We continue. It becomes more clear. Most of the interpreters are talking about Silat al Rahim and connecting with your relatives and you know visiting this and friends and has nothing to do with this ayah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us they disjoint that which Allah commanded to be linked. What is to be linked? The scripture, as we said many times before, all the parts of the scripture are interlinked, are interconnected. No wonder this is in the introduction surah. This is in the very beginning of the Quran. This is in the part of the Quran that's talking about what you expect to see in the Quran. But when you skip over the details of understanding ayah 26, and you think Allah is giving an example of a mosquito without explaining what that example is, then you're already belittling the Quran. Then you're already not ascribing to Allah his due reverence. And this is the problem that we have been highlighting with every segment on this channel. We need to focus back on the Quran so that we are not among al fasiqeen So we continue. وَيُفْسِدُونَ فِي الْأَرْضِ And they corrupt in the scripture, as we saw. أُولَٰئِكَ هُمُ الْخَاسِرُونَ Those are the losers. Those are the losers. So the rest of the two ayat, 26 and 27 of Surah Al-Baqarah, becomes extremely easy to understand once you figure out the first four portions as we have done. Now, inshallah, when we continue with the next few segments relating to the story of Adam, continuing with ayah number 28, 29, before we get into ayah number 30, you will see they're all in the same context. They're talking about the same thing. And therefore, when you get into the story of Adam, it's going to set the stage automatically for you to understand it correctly. But if you take the story of Adam starting with Ayah 30, apart from everything else that we've just done, you are disjointing the parts of the Quran that should be linked. And unfortunately, most interpreters and most translators did that. So now we continue with the presentation. In a prior segment, we talked about the distributive law. And in this segment, I want to share with you just a little hint about how the distributive law applies to Ayah 26 and 27. Here I put together a small chart that shows you how these characteristics in Ayah 26 apply to all of the different details that are provided in Ayah 27. So in Ayah 26, we have five specific characteristics. The first one is groups among Bani Israel who incite this agreement, etc., etc. The second one is they accept nothing above them. فَمَا فَوْقَهَا And the third one, الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا the fourth one, يُضِلُّ بِهِ كَثِيرًا They are many misguided. And the last one, الفاسقين, The deviant ones. So therefore now we see that every single one of these attributes is tied to everything that Ayah 27 says. That's why Ayah 27 starts with a relative pronoun. الَّذِينَ So it should be part of the same sentence. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala separated it into Ayah 27. الَّذِينَ يَنْقُضُونَ عَهْدَ الله. Those who renege, they renege on the covenant of Allah after it has been established with them. 
min ba'di mi this is the same marking that we saw with the later ayat from surah al-baqarah they disjoint what allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commanded to be linked wa yaqta'una ma amara allah bihi an yusal wa yufsiduna fil ard they corrupt in the scripture they are the losers all of these attributes on the right hand apply to all of these right attributes on the left side so therefore now we understand that we have an application of the distributive law in these two ayat and this is the eloquence of the quran so much semantics so many meanings jump at you when you break things down correctly and you understand it when allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives you the inspiration to do the right tafsil and this was gift number one and now we move to gift number two gift number two basically is a reminder that we should not assign to allah human emotions so when they said yes tahyi is about shyness or about shame or about reluctance all of these are human attributes allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not have the human emotions that we suffer and that are part of our being so therefore when a translator is using these words really they have no clue how to ascribe to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala his due reverence and gift number three is a reminder of the principle of relevance. If you remember, we talked about the principle of relevance and we said that the principle of relevance obligates us to take in consideration every letter, even every diacritical mark, fatha, damma, shadda in the Quran, nothing is extraneous. If there is a part of a sentence that did not add value, that did not add semantics, you can take it out and nothing changes. That means you did not understand something in that verse in that ayah as we saw with the particle ma particle ma is not extraneous and yadriba mathalan ma they all took it out as if it did not add any semantics as a matter of fact some of the interpreters had the audacity to say this is za'ida extraneous it doesn't mean anything and you find it unfortunately in some of the websites and the big websites and the big superstars that talk about this ayat they say ma za'ida in here it doesn't add anything why because they found it in over a dozen other places daraba mathalan and then he gives the example directly without ma and they thought well this must be a mistake a'udhu billah so ma was not za'ida and nothing is za'ida in the quran nothing is extraneous in the quran this is the way we submit to the Quran. We come to learn. We don't come to tell the Quran. We know more. Subhanallah. Gift number four deals with the fact that the Quran teaches us not only its own vocabulary, its own lexicon, but also its own style and its own morphology. So now we understand more about the morphology of the Quran because we stopped at the word ba'uda and we asked, what other words throughout the Quran have the same morpheme? And as I explained, we have at least two words that we were able to use to learn, to understand the semantic cloud associated with that morpheme. And by doing this, we applied what we learned to the word ba'uda, and we ended up with a beautiful meaning, a meaning that was reinforced, applied, confirmed, verified throughout the rest of the ayat. And as we continue, you will see for yourself, this is a beautiful concept that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allowed us to express in this video. So here we have a new bayina. The bayina is, if there is a morpheme you don't understand, go search through the Quran for other words that have the similar morpheme, perhaps other words that have the same morpheme would clarify that morpheme, and you can bring that clarification back to the word on which you are stuck. This is a brand new bayina. Nobody has shared with you before. It hasn't been expressed in any book that I found. And I study a lot. I have not found anything like this in any book. And now we come to gift number five. Gift number five says there is no parable of mosquito. The ayah 26 does not talk about the mosquito. It is talking about a group of people who are described as we just discussed. The example is not there. Ayah 26 does not offer you a parable. There is no example given. It is a methodological instruction. It is an information that is generic across all the Quran. And therefore, it belongs in the introduction. It's a beautiful declaration from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
So what does Ayah 26 say about those who insist that Allah gave the example or the parable of the mosquito? This is a profound question. I ask you to go back and read it for yourself, Ayah 26, and you should be able to answer this question. You really need to do this homework. You really need to work and understand what is Allah teaching us? And if those that speak so much about the mosquitoes and the 46 eyes and the three needles in its mouth and the eight legs and the number of wings and number of hearts and the parasite that sit on top of it and all of this, sorry, bogus, it is not there. The Quran is not talking about this. It's not even giving the example of an insect. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about something totally different that you missed and therefore are you among those who were guided or are you among those who were misguided gift number six brings us to ayah number 27 where allah subhanahu wa ta'ala derides those who disjoint that which allah commanded to be linked in the scripture and this is a significant reminder because it relates to linking the ayat and the clauses within the same context and across the whole quran as we saw the markings and this is what we're talking about again and again throughout this channel. In the coming segments, inshallah, we will see how important Ayah 26 and 27 of Surah Al-Baqarah to understanding the rest of the stories in the Quran and the stories of Adam. And there are multiple stories about Adam. And you will discover, inshallah, who or perhaps what Adam is. This is a special gift for those of you who stayed with me throughout this whole segment. If you've enjoyed what you heard and if you've benefited from what you've learned, please subscribe if you have not done so. I would really appreciate it if you click the red bell button to receive immediate notifications, like, share, and comment, and hopefully you will benefit from future segments, inshallah. And with that, we come to the closure of the segment with the dua. Alhamdulillah, alladhi hadana li hadha wa ma kunna li nahtadiya lawla an hadana Allah, laqad jaat rusul rabbina bilhaq. I thank you very much for watching. Salamun alaikum.